Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Josh. Um, I really like Josh's overview of OpenStack. It was very fair and well balanced, I thought. Uh, my goal here, yesterday I gave a brief high level overview of what OpenStack uh, Swift is and how it works. Uh, I will be on Thursday talking a little bit more about some of the um, failure scenarios of that and it's like, hey, let's see what happens if we delete a hard drive and play with it and do, do fun stuff like that. But today, I'm going to talk about Swift for new contributors. So the goal here is that all of you, being one of the premier technical conferences in the world, have the capability to commit code into Swift, and so we want that. And so I want to see new contributors coming out of the next 20, 25 minutes. So uh, I will cover in a little bit more detail about some of the nasty hairiness that Josh hinted about, about how to actually get your patch into an OpenStack project. As a uh, very brief introduction, um, for those of you who were not around and to elucidate on what Josh just mentioned, um, OpenStack Swift is a large-scale object storage system built for scale, optimized for durability, availability, and concurrency. It's uh, conceptually similar to Amazon's S3, and it's really cool. I really like it, but I've been working with it for a long time. Uh, I used to be at Rackspace. I was part of the team that wrote Swift originally at Rackspace uh, when we had it as an internal project and was on that team um, for a few years uh, after it was open sourced as part of OpenStack. Uh, this past summer, I'm sorry, I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, in June, so the past winter, uh, whatever you do down here, um, about six or se about seven or eight months ago, I left Rackspace and joined a small startup in San Francisco uh, focused on uh, some value-add features around Swift, but this is not a sales pitch. So right now, I am the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, and that simply means that I do a lot of cat herding and trying to figure out how to get different people who are contributing code to work together and find something to work on. So that is the first question. Where do I find stuff to work on? And I'm specifically talking about developers here, so I can actually say scratch your itch. Um, the best place that uh, we find new features coming from is when they actually meet production needs. I'm not at all interested, and nobody in our project is at all interested in your really cool idea because you had too much to drink last night and thought it was a really cool thing because you heard that the Facebooks did it or something like that. What I'm really interested in is hearing what your storage uh, pain points are and let's figure out how to solve them well. And then let's do it in a way that can easily scale um, up to massive levels. So what is your pain point? Let's figure out that. That is the, that is the primary thing. I want production use cases that we do. Um, one, of the, one of the underlying philosophies of Swift is that uh, it started as a production ready system. It was open sourced as a production ready system. Um, if you contribute code into Swift, within a relatively short period of time, your code will be deployed in production at very massive scale all over the world by many co companies. That's really kind of cool. Um, so let's say you're, you, you maybe didn't find something. It's like, it's kind of okay right now, but I think there's some things that maybe, just see what other people have found. I'm kind of new to the project. Um, we use uh, the Launchpad uh, project management management site for uh, tracking a lot of things in, within OpenStack. And uh, Swift has a bug tracking in Launchpad. Um, I probably should do a little bit better of curating some of those bugs, but uh, one of the things that would be very useful, uh, to be honest, is uh, some assistance of confirming some bugs and seeing what's going on there. But there are some, uh, some things in there that it would be great. Somebody would pick them up and say, hey, let's go fix this edge case or you know, this, this particular scenario. Um, also, Josh mentioned blueprints. Uh, they're a way to just say, hey, here's something, an idea I have to work on. Um, uh, Swift has, again, a small set of blueprints that uh, people have said, hey, this is an idea I'm, I'm interested in. So once you find something to work on, the next thing you need to figure out is where's the code? So we host the code on GitHub. Uh, that's the only thing we use GitHub for. We don't use GitHub issues or pull requests. Um, and uh, so you can go there right now, download the code as it, as it exists. It should be, uh, tip of master should be production ready. Uh, in fact, actually, I guess an important note is that just last, um, last week on the 24th, 
uh, we released our most recent version of Swift, uh, 176, and uh, it's ready to go. So if you are using Swift, upgrade. If you are not using Swift, that's a good version to start with. So once you have the code, uh, something that I found as a developer is I've got to figure out how this new code project works. What does it actually look like? And what is the request flow? How do things work? And here's where we're going to kind of go off, off the rails and a little free form here. So uh, actually, I should probably turn on mirroring. Pardon me. There we go. Fantastic. That is low resolution. Wow. OK. So here we have the Swift code base. And yeah. So I have the, um, I have the current version of the code here. I've op opened it up in Sublime Text. And you can see that we have a high level um, directory with some subdirectories and some extra files inside of it. Also, oops. Pardon me, just one more thing here to help out everybody. There we go. Okay. So over on the uh, left-hand side, here's their code tree. That's not supposed to keep going away. Um, we've got, um, at the top, uh, within, the, within the directory, you've got a few important things. Um, uh, overall high-level changelog file, um, the author's file who's contributed, um, and uh, the basic Python setup things. The entire uh, project is Python. It's a Python uh, WSGI app, so things like that normally apply. Uh, at the top level, just going from the top down, we've got the binary directory. This is where all of the basic uh, actual servers live. Uh, you can see there's a fair number of them, uh, but they're fairly simple, and there's not much code in here. So let's look at the account auditor. Wow, it's about mm, six lines long. Um, this simply is the binary we're going to look at from here if you want to figure out how to, uh, what needs to be run. These are, uh, this is what we go for in the binary directory. Um, we've got a tool called Swift init, which allows you to act as a manager for some of these things. You can say something like Swift init proxy restart, and it will manage the process for you. Uh, we generally don't take advantage of things like uh, upstart and initd uh, because we found when we were building it, ops guys really like to have a little more specific control uh, when they were deploying large clusters. Uh, next up is the docs. Uh, we've got man pages and also uh, Sphinx uh, documentation, uh, restructured text, fairly easy to edit and look at there. Um, all of, this, all of the, uh, these auto-generated docs that are under this uh, source tree right here um, are hosted at swift.openstack.org, and they are updated with every commit, um, automatically pushed, and regen regenerated and pushed. The next up is our Etsy folder, and the Etsy folder is a sample uh, config files for every config file uh, that we have. Every option uh, should be in, and I believe is, within these sample config files. These are using standard uh, paste deploy con style config files. Um, and so looking at, for example, let's look at the proxy server one. Um, we start with a default section that's going to be there. Every default option within Swift, every default configurable within Swift is commented out with the uh, default that is used a as the value. So by default, we're going to uh, bind to every interface on port 80, for example. Um, looking down, we've got the pipeline, which is, uh, if, if you are familiar with uh, the way that um, uh, WSGI applications work, uh, you have a series of middleware plugins that uh, take the request uh, on the way in and pass it down to the next one in the chain and then pass the response all the way back up the chain. Uh, so the pipeline here, um, uh, you can see this is what we're doing. Uh, notice it's not commented out. This means it is a required option that you are uh, forced to define. And then the uh, various sections uh, here. So we've got the proxy server and the pipeline, um, which means that we also have a proxy server uh, section. 
um, and the following sections, for example, a couple of uh, sample sections for uh, authentication, um, for, uh, let's see, we've got some the health check middleware, some ca uh, memcache layers. Uh, anyway, goes on down, we've got lots of options in here, lots of different knobs you can tune. Next up is, let's skip down to test because it's fairly simple. In here are automated uh, unit and functional tests. These are generally not, uh, you don't generally mess with uh, running things out of this directory. We've got some helper scripts uh, for both unit tests and functional tests, sorry, functional test and uh, something called probe tests, which are kind of in between unit test and functional test and the way you can test um, the insides of a black box of a distributed cluster. Um, the big part where the ARC code actually is is in the Swift directory. And the Swift directory is then organized into um, the four basic pieces of Swift that I talked about yesterday, the proxy, the account, the container, and the object, and then a common directory where there are utility methods and you know things that how to deal with process management, management things, uh, how to deal with uh, you know standard HTTP things. Um, so to first off, looking at the common, uh, again you can see we've got a nice utility. We've got utilities file, for example, things dealing with uh, WSGI applications, uh, exception handlings, uh, constraints within the cluster, um, how those are set and defined. Um, and then we've got two directories. The ring is where the ring data structure is uh, stored and managed. This is the data structure that actually um, determines. Uh, where data is placed within the cluster. If you want to uh, figure out how to, uh, how data is placed in the cluster, change that, add new features to it, this is the place to look. And then we've got the middleware area, and this is the uh, middleware that ships with Swift. Um, some is some uh, interesting uh, features you can optionally add on. Um, some things are fairly common, uh, fairly basic that you should have all the time, like some caching layers, and this is just a nice way to uh, a nice caching layer that's going to work in an invented, highly concurrent system. Uh, Again, so a sample auth file, uh, an auth uh, middleware that plugs in with a keystone uh, from uh, from the other, from the rest of the OpenStack project. Um, ACL handling. Uh, this one, actually, I'll talk just a little bit about this one because it was just committed mere days ago. Um, this is a this bulk. Uh, middleware allows you to do bulk operations. For example, say, I need to delete a thousand objects with one command. Or, for example, uh, the one that I'm really excited about here is let's, uh, let's upload a tar file and explode it on the back end. So I want to upload a tar file and then each file that's actually referenced inside of that tar file is now an individually addressable object within the cluster. That's kind of a cool thing, I think. Um, so now the proxy server. Uh, the proxy server uh, has a server, uh, naturally. This is the actual process that um, runs and uh, accepts and responds to requests. Uh, it handles, um, based on your request, uh, it calls a particular controller, uh, so the object controller, container controller, account controller, and then, of course, a common high-level class there. Um, and the uh, proxy server will then communicate with the backend object server, container server, or account server as necessary. Each one of these directories are very similar. They have a server, and then they also have the background consistency processes, um, the code for that. Uh, the replication um, and, the count, uh, and the auditing is, is common across these. Um, the object, uh, there's also the updaters and the account reaper. Um, we don't need to go into detail on those. Um, now, let's trace just very high level, very quickly, uh, the overview of the data flow within a request. In the, uh, let's get a little bit more room on the screen. Uh, let's see. Nope, not that one. Uh, where's the sidebar? Not sidebar. Perfect. Or better yet, there we go. Full screen. Great. So now we are in the proxy server, and uh, this is the entry point for everything. A standard Whiskey app. So we can look all the way down at the bottom and see that we have. Where is this actually? Let's see. Proxy server pi. Okay, yep, that's where we are. Ah, uh, yes. Down at the bottom, we have our factory, which calls our application class, um, and inside uh, the class is instantiated. Configs are set up, and then when a request comes in, we go to the call method. It's a standard Python callable, and this is what actually handles everything. Um, 
The first thing it's going to do, uh, it's going to set up the appropriate caching as necessary and call handle request. Handle request will get the appropriate controller. Here's handle request. It gets the appropriate controller as necessary and then will, um, where is that next one? It will call the handler on it. And the handler is the actual request method that is, that is used here. So we're looking at the request method. So this is like a git, put, post, delete, things like that. And then we will look for a uh, controller, say the object controller. So we're going to do an object put. So in this case, we have a method on the object controller that says, here's the put. So the handle request will call here, which will then, of course, do things like check the container info and uh, make sure things actually work. Um, in this case, this one's probably one of the more complicated pieces. Probably shouldn't have used that as an example. Um, but eventually, we're going to go down and we're going to get the appropriate uh, storage nodes to talk to in the background, set up some concurrency here, and um, then start uh, get, uh, get connections to the backend objects, start uh, serializing um, all of the data sent to the, um, sent to the backend server, and uh, then we will make sure everything has been read correctly. And if everything is fine, um, well, actually, to check, check if everything is fine, we uh, check to see what the status codes were responded, uh, and then we will choose the appropriate response to send back. In this case, for example, if you're doing a put on an object, Swift requires that you have a quorum of the uh, replicas have responded with a success. So if you have three replicas, two of them must respond uh, with a success before the client will get success. This is really what the proxy server does, is coordinates the communication with the backend servers. Um, on the backend servers themselves, if you're looking at the object server itself, um, it again is also a WSGI app. And so down here at the bottom, you've got an app factory which instantiates an object controller and that will set up the appropriate config options and has its, oh, what are we doing here? It's call method, I don't know what's going on here. There we go. Calls the call method and it's going to write the, write the actual data to disk and then sends that back up through its own appropriate middleware and uh, send the response back to the, uh, to the um, proxy server which will then coordinate the responses, send it back. So high level here, the uh, starting point for everything is the proxy server. It's a standard WSGI app. You look at the call method on when, and that is how the request actually gets in. At that point, it's passed to the appropriate backend server. It goes through the exact same thing because that is simply another uh, WSGI app on the back end. Then that's going to be uh, thrown back up the pipeline, back over the, uh, the open connection to the proxy server. The decision will be made uh, from all of the back end storage servers and then sent to the client. So that being said, let's say, quick uh, pop quiz here. There's a method within Swift that uh, is called split path. It's very useful because um, it will take the uh, path info off of the URI and figure out, is this actually a, an account request, a container request, an object request, or is it invalid overall? So this is something that would be nice and common to all levels of the stack. So where would it live within the Swift code base? in common, that is correct. Three points for you. Yay, Swift common, utils, and you can see that we have split path right there, nice doc strings, and there you go, ta-da. So now, switching back. So now you understand how this all works, you've, ma you've made your magical patches and everything is good. So here's the, here's the hairy ball of nastiness. We have the CLA process, and that offers a couple of, ex, a couple being four or five extra steps, including human intervention to get your code in there. So high level, we use Garrett to uh, do code reviews, and uh, we have the CI system uh, run by Monty and his team uh, to do gating on all of the patches. But to even get it into Garrett, you first need to sign the CLA. 
There is a fairly verbose uh, document on the OpenStack wiki on how to contribute, uh, named as such. So the basic process is you need to sign, uh, do a DocuSign of the OpenStack CLA, and then you need to uh, add your receipt number to the appropriate wiki page on the OpenStack wiki. At that point, you need to uh, join, uh, petition for membership in the OpenStack CLA launchpad group, and then somebody who is a member will be able to approve you after they have verified that, you, uh, that the signature you put on the wiki page is appropriate. At that point, um, you can now download and configure the uh, Git review tool, which has some very nice helper methods for submitting into OpenStack, although it technically is not uh, exclusive to that. And then you can Git review your patch, your branch, and it will be submitted uh, into the appropriate place, and everyone else can look at it. John? Yeah? Fantastic, the CLA process is gonna get a lot simpler in about a month, because this is the thing that I hate about the whole process, because it's... We finally got the lawyers to agree to just let us do something really simple. Good. Fantastic, okay. So this is going to get better, and it's, so do it now. It's a one-time cost, but it will get better for new contributors later. So once you've done that, um, the, uh, once you have submitted your patch, at that point, uh, the, each, each group, each open source project within the uh, group is essentially uh, organized into contributors and uh, core developers. The core developers in the old school terminology are the ones with commit access essentially, not directly because it is a gated project, but the point is they're the ones who can actually trigger the gates to merge it into, into the trunk. Um, as a general rule, um, all of the OpenStack projects uh, require that two core contributors have signed off on your patch. Um, they will, uh, I found, uh, I've only really worked with the Swift project in this sense, but I found that all of the core contributors are extremely, well, most of them are extremely smart, and uh, I'll accept myself on that, um, and, the, uh, and very willing to help people out and say, yes, that's a great idea, however, when you're doing it, over here, in this use case that we have, it's not gonna work, or hey, did you consider this maybe alternative approach? Very uh, very good welcoming community in that sense. Um, very patient with working with people uh, to, to get uh, your patches in. At that point, it's uh, approved for merge, it's merged in uh, after it goes through the gating process, and congratulations, you're now an OpenStack contributor. So, now you need some help. This is the, my last slide. So, if you need some help, uh, the absolute best place for real-time feedback on what to do is on IRC. Uh, we've got a couple of channels uh, that are the canonical channels for what to do. Um, OpenStack is a great place for people who have questions about the overall project. OpenStack Dev is historically the place where um, if you are a contributor and want to ask questions about that, it's a good place uh, to go. Um, a lot of times, with a, as OpenStack has grown, it's gotten a little, little uh, hard to separate the signal from noise in OpenStack Dev, and so many of the projects, including Swift, have set up an OpenStack dash, their project name. If you have questions about contributing into Swift, um, I would encourage you to ask in OpenStack dash Swift. Um, I didn't put that up here because I'm not trying to promote it as, hey, if you've got Swift questions, join that. If you've got Swift questions, come in OpenStack. I'll be happy to help you. Um, we, you can also go onto the OpenStack uh, mailing list, uh, list.openstack.org, uh, can sign up for that. Docs.openstack.org, swift.openstack.org, uh, have some very good docs, high level. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, community on the side documentation. The company I work for, uh, SwiftStack, uh, provides a lot of uh, helpful docs and videos about uh, different parts of Swift and how they work. Um, just some uh, community blogs that I've seen, uh, Julian Danju has written a couple of good blog posts. Uh, Shmuel um, is one of our um, core contributors and has written uh, quite a few good blog posts and tools around how to use Swift. Um, and that's it. So we are right now, um, as of today, have 94 contributors into Swift. So I certainly hope that somebody in this room will become our 100th contributor into Swift. And soon. Is there a, so, is there a what? A free download of Swift. <laughs> no, no. If, if you become the 100th con contributor this week, I will buy you a beer. Otherwise, you have to come to San Francisco and I'll buy you a beer there. So, what's that? There you go. 
That is a good point. <laughs> so yes, you get to go to the OpenStack Summit for free, which is a fantastic conference about getting people together on building these really cool stuff. And also it gives you voting privileges within the OpenStack organization. And so if you want to be PTL for Swift instead of me, you can run and garner your votes and I may vote for you, so. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really a great thing. So, um, you know, kind of the high level overall, um, you know, I, I can say personally, there's been nothing better in my career than OpenStack. Um, and uh, it is something that I truly believe is going to change the world. I'm going to talk a little bit more about my high level philosophy and why I think OpenStack is awesome on Thursday. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, yes. What's the minimum um, system you need to get, it, uh, get an open stack, um, as you mentioned, up and running? That is a great question and something I should have addressed. Um, minimum, uh, all of the developers for OpenStack run a Swift all-in-one environment. Um, I have that running on a one gig cloud server. I also have a VM running in VirtualBox on this laptop. It's kind of a powerful laptop, but I've run it uh, in a VM on a MacBook Air before. Um, you don't need a lot of hardware to get the conceptual pieces running together to be able to do functional testing. Um, you're going to need a lot of hardware to actually test at scale, but that's why we have a big community. Um, so you can run that. We've got some documentation on that. Swift.openstack.org has the instructions on how to get uh, up and running. Um, I was just going through that this last week, preparing for this week, and I realized it's a little out of date, so I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But uh, yeah, not, not much at all. Thanks, Tom.